thought of a retrial or a second bite of the apple where the unfair trial right was breached in the manner that it did in the circumstances from incident two to incident three and then the, the justification for breaching what we know is common practice in the Jamaican schools to ensure that you leave one sentence so that the deliberation takes place on the next day. And that would be my submission, that the conviction should be quashed or ought to be quashed. In, and I trust you always been on, on that. Lee, as to the obvious um, result, that of course a juror who's refusing to obey directions has to go. He has to go. Well, well, from here, it is, as, as they pointed out, they're the losers in this. And they are prepared. I'm, I've, I've well, how can you be sure? We, you just don't know. You don't know. Well, well, well one people, idea. one idea for everybody doing good as always. So, dear. Police officers did not have access to, and where the much, much counsel from the lower level, which with Tom Tavares KFC, would have said, listen. This is a, a man from Ireland who would have come, would have come to Jamaica, not given any effect to the right, and he gives testimony. This is Simmons, and he doesn't say whether he knows exactly what's in each and every file, and we have nothing to cross reference, so they would have failed on that test. The, the last thing I will say before I take my seat, Alois, I'm a lady is in relation to the trial, the jury, the jury point, is I certainly, and I, I've read for this case about four years, in relation to the jury point, there it has never been in the modern common law where a jury who we know for a fact is poisoned, is tainted, was allowed to remain on a jury to bring a verdict simply because the legislation would have prevented him from being discharged, where it is clear on its face that that juror ought to have been removed to protect the fair trial right. And it is in that vein that I will say that there is no cure, no proviso, or, or, or no thought of a retrial or a second bite of the apple, where the unfair trial right was breached in the manner that it did in the circumstances from incident two to incident three, and then the, the justification for breaching what we know is common practice in the Jamaican schools to ensure that you leave one sentence so that the deliberation takes place on the next day. And that would be my submission, that the conviction should be quashed or ought to be quashed, in, and I trust you always been on, on that. Thank you. So, basically, when... If it pleases the court, Lord and ladies, I just wish to make a point, a couple points, but to start with questions, the clarifications to questions, the first one being raised by, by Lord Lloyd Jones, and this would have been in relation to in, in relation to the chamber hearing. Now in, 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 in the Jamaican in the Jamaican context, the right of the accused to be present at all stages of the proceedings. Uh, the concept of the chair chamber hearing respectfully would be that the courtroom would become the chamber. Yeah. So the, the gallery would be cleared mm. and certainly the attorneys, the representatives, and, and then you would have the accused there. The, this, the, the bench book says that. The, that, that that's correct. But my Lord, in, in that situation, because it was, it was uh, a situation within the transcript which reflects that it was actually a conversation between one of the appellants and the son of the jury. She didn't actually see or, or confronted the appellant. Mm -hmm. And so she was concerned. So she only heard information and the, the inquiry didn't go as far as to, to, to find out the truth of that inquiry. Yeah. And so it led to a discharge. 
what, what follows from that is the opportunity would have been lost for the, any of the, the appellants if questioned or if to, to say, well, this is not true. And then the judge would have made an informed decision. What follows from that also is that the forewoman, for the foreman, she was a part of the, the questioning. She was then asked if she was allowed to, if she could continue. She says, I'm only worried about the safety of the lady, the juror number 11. And she leaves knowing the information and it's fresh in her mind and remains in her mind. We have no way of knowing but to speculate what, how much conversations outside of that would have gone to the other jurors. Then, moving back to the next inquiry number three, it is the same four woman and more conversations about her role. And, and so the taint or the poison would have gone back as far as November in a 65-day trial and before jury number 11 left. So a proper inquiry could have found out, especially in a space where we do not know at what point or, or if any, when, when it is exactly the responses or if the other jurors could have said that that wasn't the case at the time, if a proper inquiry and asking each and every juror not even suggesting that it be done on the oath, but if it was asked what their responses would have been for the judge to make an informed decision. And I say this in the context that in light of the fact that our constitution it places even a duty on the judge to, as the custos morum of the constitution, to protect the rights of the, the appellants, that it was incumbent on him to ensure that he makes the inquiry so he protects the fair trial right. So that would be in response to your question as it connects, it connects. So what flows from that then is when we get to the late retirement, we have a, a, a juror who is the fruit of the poisonous tree or the, the introduction of the poison, no knowledge of how far the poison is. I'm not inviting the court to speculate, but that's all we are left to do respectfully. And what happens in that situation is that we don't know if the pressure arises because there, were, there, there was a situation where these jurors were able to say, I would participate in a bribe, allegedly, or not. And so the verdict that comes could never be a true verdict in light of that. So that's the submission as it connects from incident two to incident three. Now, in relation to provise, the proviso, and I think you had knocked some of the win out of Ms. A. Lord Reed because I would have borrowed your words in, in, in the judgment to say that you can't proviso unfairness, you can't proviso unjust. It's just not possible. It would have been an absurdity in the law. Uh, now, in, in, in relation to Lord Simla, Lady Simla, Simla you asked a question about the balance in our rights, the, the balance in exercise. I would submit to you that the, the Jamaican constitution, in particular the charter, it came at a time post the Phipps decision. So there was a lot said about um, King and, <coughs> and, and certainly Phipps, the Phipps judgment. But at that time, it was presumption of constitutionality, and certainly the onus was on the appellant, on the appellant to prove the, the privacy right violation. Post the judgment in Phipps, our legislators, which our, par our parliament certainly has that ability to represent the people, and they would have thought that as a matter of public interest, the, the very right, the charter rights, in particular, the communication rights, which is for all, the least among us has that right, was to be protected in such a way that where there is a breach of that right, it's a distinct difference. What difference is that, Lady Simna would have asked, is that the judge, is now, the judge now has a duty to carry out the Oaks test, 
or the demonstrably justifiable test. Because somebody says, and in response to Lord Reed, but the, the appellants are not here to complain of that right. But they did, at first instance, do their counsels collectively. And at that, that basic complaint about the right follows that it, the judge is to call upon the prosecutor to say that it is demonstrably justified because there's no issue before this court that there was a breach. The effect of the breach or the balancing exercise can only begin after the prosecutor has met the burden of demonstrably justifiable. So, can, can, can I ask Mr Buchanan, uh, yes. while you're addressing us on the Charter, um, as I understand it, the Charter um, is formally, um, is part of a constitution, it's a, it, was in, it was made part of a constitution by a constitutional amendment in 2011. That is right? correct. Was it preceded by some sort of um, review or report? The, my, my, my learned friend, actually, Mr. Salty Casey, actually um, made mention of, of the review and the report. Ah, but right. What is significant check, that check my notes. Right. <laughs> right. What is significant that comes from it is yeah. that, and we take pride in this, and I'm, I'm quoting, I'm, well, I'm paraphrasing our, our Chief Justice, and it is, it's, found, thank you, it's found in the written case at 12 and 13. Yes. Right, thank you. Yes, but what we, as I was saying earlier, we take pride to say that this amendment, which is separate from any other Caribbean jurisdiction, was for, for us, it was made by us, and it was a testimony of our, our road, our, our, our evidence of independence. Yes. Where we, had, we, where we decided what rights would be protected, and especially the dynamics of the Jamaican society yes. is the importance of protecting the least among us. And was it intended that it be um, developed, uh, um, I, I suppose, uh, I, was it meant to be what you might call a, an autochthonous um, bill of rights, if we can call it that, that would be developed by the Jamaican judiciary in light of circumstances in Jamaica, or was it intended to be um, influenced by um, uh, comparative human rights jurisprudence looking at other charters of rights and constitutional guarantees in other countries? I'm, I'm happy that you asked that question because we did look and I'm saying we because I, I take pride in being Jamaican. But we did look at other jurisdictions such as South Africa, mm -hmm. and if you if you even the Canadian, uh, the Canadian and the yeah. United States. But what you'll see, what a, a clear a clear indication. And again, my friend is indicating that it's in the written case yeah. at 20 and 21. Yeah. But what what what's significant is that what what is clear is that there is similar to in the Canadian jurisdiction that the, the, the test, which is the demonstrably justifiable test, is mandatory once the right is, once there is a breach. Mm -hmm. And before us now is that there was a breach. Yeah. The learned judge, and I, I will say this respectfully, this came at a time when the charter was very young. And so the contemplation to give effect to it, as judges do in interpreting the intent of, of the legislature. Oh, yes. Yes, and I, and I see paragraph 13 yes. draws our attention to what the Chief Justice, uh, Chief Justice Sykes, has, has said, that it's, not, it's autochthonous, which means it's indigenous, homegrown, originating with us, rather than imposed from outside. Yeah. And the, the, what, what, what is key, which I, will, will, which I will get to, and I agree with you, and I adopt the words of, mm -hmm. of, of our Chief Justice, yep. is, is, the, is the fact that after looking at constitutions all over the world. What we decided is what is important to us. So what we have is a section 13 b And I know there are many persons, I quote it so much that it becomes an annoyance to many. But 13 to the protection given to every citizen on the 13 b it is the last flicker or, or shimmer of light to what it is to be a human. Yep. And it, 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 it separates the state clearly from the, 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 the human being. 
and, and it, it, it says, listen, all state actors have a duty not to abridge, abrogate, or breach the rights. And when you do that, you must show that it is demonstrably justifiable. So in, uh, in an answer, yes, thank you. So in, in an answer to that, Lady Silmi, that balancing exercise as to the evidence when it was asked about, especially in relation to what was on JS2, doesn't even begin to come up until after the judge would have made that, carried out that exercise of the demonstrably justifiable test, and he did not do it. Yeah. So we have nothing on the record as to any submissions from the state, from the Crown, to say, here, it, it notwithstanding, it is justifiable. There were less restrictive measures, or here is why there is a breach. So we don't have that before us, and that is, that, that is the one flaw in the judge's acceptance. And he, he, evidence of that is he was concerned. He made words to um, my senior, Mr. Taylor, who is in the room, that if he was not daunted by the change in the charter because there, and the significance of it, the response at that level was nothing much changes even after the concession. But we do recognize the importance of it, but to submit to the court that the test wasn't done, and so there's no balance in exercise to which could have happened. And, and, and because this is our apex court, the apex court would, could not respectfully substitute what the judge at first in, instance ought to have done. And in those circumstances, the, the answer to question A, the <coughs> evidence was, collated, collected, and secured. So secured would have been the request from the police officer. The collection and collating would have been the what flows from JS2, the cell site, the text messages, the call positioning, what, what, whatever flows from JS2. But all of that would have been no moment. And a key thing before I depart, because I, I don't want to take up too much time or the well, you, you, don't, you don't have a great deal of time left. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was being cheeky, Lord Reed, but I, I didn't know you would figure me out. <laughs> but but the, the, key, the, key, the key thing in, in, in relation to, to, to that aspect is to understand that as we make heavy weight of JS2, what's incumbent on the judge was that in a demonstrably justifiable test, I would submit respect to, respectfully that the, in the absence of JS1, which was the controlled copy that... Join Planet Fitness during the Big Fitness Energy... ...them to abide by their oath. Well, that, in my submission, is a separate question. Yeah, the, the way it's put in public is a, a real risk that they might have become... Yes. ...consciously or unconsciously prejudiced. Real risk they might have become... I, that's why... I, forgive me, my lord. That was, I, was, I was trying to go by the Putnam test, consciously or unconsciously. Mm. Is that something which is going to be in the back of their minds? Come what may. Um, now, on the first question, namely, you've got one rotten apple here, so that's it. We say that can't be right. Uh, and um, we have in our written case drawn attention to the case of Brown, which is in the electronic bundle at 6329, paragraph 31, where a uh, not identical thing happened, but the problem arose, what is a judge to do? <laughs> Um, or rather, the, the, the point was made that appellate, the defendants cannot derail trials just by making offers of bribes to juries and so forth. It's not on all fours, but I submitted to the point from all the same. So it's uh, 6329. <laughs> And it's paragraph 31. Um, we fully understand any judge's reluctance to discharge a jury in circumstances to which a defendant bore material responsibility. <laughs> Although there are no doubt gradations of responsibility, starting with deliberate misconduct by a defendant aimed at achieving a discharge in circumstances where a child is going badly, 
court achieving a favourable verdict and ranging downwards in seriousness from those situations. Counsel for the uh, appellant thus rightly, in our view, accepted before us that it cannot be open to a defendant to obtain the discharge of a jury by deliberately creating some ground of aggravation or discord between him and the jury, whether inside or outside court. But in order for a judge to rely on the appellant's responsibility for events occurring as a ground for not discharging a jury, the circumstances giving rise to such responsibility must, it seems to us, either be agreed or ascertained by the judge to exist. It cannot be assumed simply that it is a prima facie case. Now, that's not on all fours, but I submit the basic point is this. It's not open to uh, either a defendant himself or, indeed, a juror acting, if you like, without instructions um, from the defendant, but nonetheless in the defendant's interest, to derail a trial. And I submit that's an important point, and I submit it also goes to the whole jury system, and it will bring the jury system into disrepute uh, in a case such as this. If the position is really this, there are ten innocent <coughs> jurors who have performed their duty, assume for the moment, who have performed their duty without any shred of bias. It would bring the system into disrepute if the verdict is nonetheless to be set aside because of the one bad juror who was not obeying his duty. I submit that it would be, one can understand what you might call the purest version of that. One can understand, of course, the notion that a jury has collective responsibility. But in my submission, that would be a very, would strike, I submit, uh, the, what you might call the man in the street, the sensible man in the street, as a remarkable result. But the uh, normal scenario would be that, of course, you'd get rid of that juror. I agree. Um, the difficulty here... I mean, you wouldn't say, well, you can carry on with that juror. But I think, my laws, I'm, I'm bound to accept that the, we don't know, of course, but obviously what concerned the judge is, I, I don't think I took you specifically to it, but he does at one point say, what am I going to, have to, what am I going to do? Either yes. I let the jury, juror out, in which case the case can't continue, or it carries on. I accept what your lordship says, but my lord, again... But what I'm saying is the yeah. quote from paragraph 31 leads yes. to the obvious um, result that, of course, a juror who's refusing to obey directions has to go. He has to go. Well, I That agree. doesn't then follow that, oh, you can leave him on. No. <laughs> Subject to one point, what I call the waiver point. And the prosecution here, it is, as, as they pointed out, they're the losers in this. And they are prepared... I'm, I've, I've well, how can you be sure? We, you just don't know. You don't know. Well, well, my, my lady, I, well, funny enough, we do know in one sense, because it was a 10-1 verdict, and we know from evidence acquired afterwards that you-know-who was the one. I don't think there's any doubt about that. <laughs> um, and that, that, well, that was a matter of witness evidence obtained by, funny enough, the defence afterwards. Yes, so the, but if, yes. if, if, if as a... Well, I, I, think, I, I think the point that her, her ladyship is, is, is making is that... Is that one, one doesn't know how people may react to an attempt to bribe them um, if they thought, if the jurors thought that an attempt was being made to bribe them on behalf of the defendants, then that might have inclined, who knows, it could have inclined them to dig their heels in and prejudice them against the defendants. My, my, my Lord, I agree. That, 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 of course, is the second question. Mm. I'm just on the first question for the moment. Mm. Can I, uh, uh, namely, there was just a rotten See ya people, so I don't get to hear from...